With me, please, to the sixth chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. And while you're turning, let me just, uh, let's take a little quiz here. Take out a half sheet of paper. <laughs> How many books are in the Bible? Okay, 66. How many Old Testament books? 39. How many New Testament books then? 27. 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament. Well, huh? you know how many chapters the book of Isaiah has in it? 66. Did you know that the first 39 chapters of Isaiah are chapters that I call uh, condemnation, in other words, judgment? And the last 27 chapters, 40 to 66, are chapters of comfort. In fact, that's how chapter 40 begins. Comfort ye, my people, right? Right in the center of that second part of Isaiah, in the 27 chapters, 40 through 66, right in the center is chapter 53. And chapter 53 is the suffering servant, right? And if I was going to preach a message about uh, Jesus and his suffering on that tree from the uh, prophets, I would take you most likely to Isaiah chapter 53. Because that is the heart of God's comforting message, not only to Israel, but to the world. A suffering Savior. I've had you turn to chapter 6. Because as far as I'm concerned, chapter 6 is really the opening chapter of the book of Isaiah. Here we are given, the, the, the prophet is given his mission. Here he launches his prophetic ministry, and it is through what happens here in this sixth chapter that he is sustained for his entire ministry. And I quickly want to uh, show you a couple of things here. Notice in verse uh, 1, the words, I saw, the prophet Isaiah speaking, I saw. And then look at uh, verse 5 of Isaiah 6, and he said, I am undone. And then in verse 8, I heard. So, I saw, I am undone. I heard those three movements of chapter 6 really are a summary of what the prophet uh, is called to and how it all fits into his prophetic ministry. I want to pause a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, would you open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things in your prophets in this portion in Isaiah and would you show us yourself? Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. He saw his, the hem of his robe just filling the whole temple sanctuary, the, whole, the holy of holies. And I pray, Lord, we'd see you in your glory today. And as a result, our hearts would be greatly prepared to see you in your humility as we partake around the Lord's table, a humbled Savior, a suffering Savior. We thank you for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. He says, I saw, in verse 1, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. His train, the hem of his kingly robe, filled the entire temple. I saw. What did he see? Well, what Isaiah saw was a vision of the glory of God, is what he saw. He saw the exalted and majestic position of the true king. King Uzziah died that year. He died as a leper, you remember? He intruded into the priest's office, and as a result, God struck him with leprosy right on the spot, and he died of his leprosy, God's judgment upon him. But he saw the true king, the Lord of hosts, 
the one who is called holy three times by these angelic beings. And as a result of that, he says in verse 5, I'm undone. I am undone. Literally, I'm destroyed. I am totally wrecked. I'm unworthy. By the way, if you ever get a spiritual vision, not a physical one, but a spiritual vision of the glory of God, that's the kind of impact it will have on you. I'm undone. I'm destroyed. I've seen God's glory. You remember when Peter and the other fishermen were out on the, uh, launched out into the deep in Luke chapter 5, Jesus is just uh, breaking in his young disciples, and they fished, and they hadn't caught anything all night. Jesus says, launch out into the deep. They do what he says, really under protest, but they do what he said, and when they cast the net, they catch so much fish the net breaks. And Peter is so overwhelmed by that miracle. The Bible says that he came and he fell down at the feet of Jesus and he said, depart from me for I'm a sinful man. Basically he's saying, I'm undone like the prophet. I'm destroyed. I am a sinful man. I'm unworthy of being in your presence. That's what the prophet is saying. He got a sight of the glory of God and the impact upon that, seeing God's glory, I'm undone. And look at how undone he says he is. I am so undone, all I can see is my impurity. I'm, an un, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm impure. And the others around me are impure too as I have seen your glory. Notice this. In that fifth verse, he first of all, having seen the glory of God, got, in, got a glimpse of God's glory, he sees himself as unclean, and then he sees others as being unclean, and that's the way it goes. You first see your own impurity, your own sinfulness, before you ever point out anyone else's sinfulness. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And then look at verse uh, 6. One of those angelic beings, seraphims, they flew and they had a live coal in their hand which they had taken with tongs from off the altar. Probably the altar of burnt offering. And laid it upon my mouth. And of course this is all figurative. This is a vision laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, thine iniquity is taken away, thy sin is purged. Notice, I saw, and as a result, I'm undone, I'm unclean, I'm impure. God responds to that kind of cry. And there is forgiveness. Your sin is taken away. Your lips are purged. Your lips are cleansed. God's consuming fire. By the way, a symbol of the Holy Spirit of God. You remember at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended upon that early church like tongues of fire rested over their head. Symbol of the Holy Spirit's presence. The fire, the consuming fire of God. That is what brought that cleansing to this man. And then he says, I heard, verse 8, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go, notice this, for us? The triune God, who shall go for us? So, immediately, his response to seeing the glory of God is, I'm undone. I'm unclean. And God purges him. He gets his cleansing from the Lord. His sin is removed. And right after that, God issues him a call. Whom shall I send? His immediate response of seeing God's glory without any hesitation, send me. He volunteers for service even before he knows the extent of the mission, before he knows the details, because he is so overwhelmed 
with the vision of the glory of God that when you get that kind of a sense of God's glory, it will not spawn any other response but, Lord, whatever, here I am, I'm yours. Do with me whatever you choose. Send me wherever you want. He probably thought that the glory of God that he saw and the response that it had, an impact it had upon him, boy, when he started his ministry, they would respond the same way. Much to his chagrin, that's not how it worked out. Look at God's call to him. When he said, I'll do it, God said, okay, go and tell this people, hear indeed, but don't understand. See indeed, but don't perceive. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Oh, but when I saw your glory, it just leveled me at your feet. Lord, they're not going to be leveled like me. How long? Verse 11. How long do I have to have such an unsuccessful ministry? How long is this going to go on where these people are not going to understand? They're not going to get it. They're not going to see the spiritual truth that I have been commissioned to give to them. God says, until their cities be wasted with no inhabitant, until there's not a man in a house, and the land is just totally desolate, and the Lord's removed them far away, and there be a, a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But I want to give you just a little bit of hope. But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return. There's that remnant that returns back to the land and shall be eaten as a teal or an oak whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. They wouldn't see God's glory like Isaiah saw God's glory, they'd totally miss it. And for as long as it takes, though his, his ministry would be unsuccessful, his preaching rather than drawing people to the Lord would harden their hearts against the Lord. I can't imagine a worse ministry than that. That God has deliberately said, I'm going to use your preaching to show these people how I hide my face from them when they don't listen to me. And John chapter 12, I think, is just a little bit of a biblical commentary on Isaiah chapter 6. So I want you to turn now to John chapter 12. And the 12th chapter of John... I believe it is verse 23 that I would have you first look at. Jesus is, he's heading to the cross. And Jesus, he answered uh, Philip and Andrew, and he said, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn or grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. If it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He's talking about his crucifixion. He's talking about his, his uh, imminent death that's coming. The hour is come, he says, speaking of his death, in which the Son of Man will be glorified. The glory of God is seen in the crucifixion of the Son of God. And isn't it interesting when you drop down in the same chapter to about verse uh, 37, though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord... Who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Where is that found in Isaiah's prophecy? Chapter 53, the opening verses. 
Why would he say that? Verse 39. Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, and that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. Where is that recorded in Isaiah's prophecy? Chapter 6, where we just read. And so Jesus brings, at his crucifixion, he brings Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 6 together. The blindness of Israel. A God who is deliberately hiding his face from them. In fact, Matthew 13, his disciples asked, why do you speak in parables? He said, I speak in parables so that people won't understand what I'm saying. To deliberately hide the truth from Israel. That's why God told Jewish people that he cured and performed miracles on, that he cast demons out of, or healed their eyes, or don't tell anyone, because he is hiding from Israel as he is today. He's hiding his face. That was the, that was the, the crux of Isaiah's ministry. And it was God's judgment upon them. God raised up a prophet to bring his judgment, but also to bring comfort to them. All that hope in chapter 40 to 66. But it all culminates at the cross. It all culminates in chapter 53. It all culminates, as Jesus said here, uh, the hour has come that the Son of Man must be glorified. And look at the next verse in chapter 12, verse 41. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Oh, the glory of God that Isaiah saw in chapter 6 was none other than the glory of the Son of God, none other than Jesus the Messiah. He saw his glory and spake of him. He saw the glory of Jesus, the suffering servant, the Messiah. He said, I saw, I am undone, I heard. I saw God's glory, his holiness. It humbled me to see my personal unworthiness. It led me to confess my sin and uh, receive his cleansing and it opened the door for me to be his servant have you seen god's glory if you have you confessed your sin and you've experienced god's forgiveness and god's cleansing but have you fully surrendered to his call upon your life his will for you in the year that king uzziah died I saw also the Lord high and lifted up. And the seraphims cried the one to the other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the doors shook at their voice. And the smoke, God's presence, filled the temple, filled the place. That glorious God that Isaiah saw, that Jesus he saw, is the Jesus that humbled himself and gave himself to be that suffering servant in Isaiah 53, that we are remembering his suffering as we partake this very day of the bread that represents his pierced body and of the cup that represents his shed blood. All of that, God's marvelous plan, that's the glory of God. No greater display of God's glory. Jesus said the hour has come when the Son of God must be glorified, and it was when he was hanging on that tree. And he said, if I be lifted up, he meant on the tree, I will draw all men to myself, because you'll see me glorified.
Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you will have prepared our heart to sit around your table and to partake together of a meal that represents your great suffering and your glory. And I'm so thankful that there's coming a day when we'll have a feast together. We'll sit around that table in the New Jerusalem and we'll have a feast, a marriage feast. What a glorious hope we have. But until then, till you come, we partake today to remember your death for us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.